My name is Roger Berkowitz, and uh, welcome to the Hunter and Center Virtual Reading Group. Thanks all for being here. Um, just give me a thumbs up if people can hear me, so I know we're we're hearing. Great, thank you. So, um, welcome back uh, after a couple of weeks absence. Um, we finished the Origins of Totalitarianism, which is an accomplishment. So, all those all those of you who participated in that, congratulations. Uh, it's a great book. It's a big book. The advantage of reading uh, what we're going to be reading now, Between Past and Future, uh, there's a couple advantages to it. One is Hannah Arendt uh, actually at one point said it was her favorite book that she wrote. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's the book that I recommend to people to read uh, about uh, by Hannah Arendt when they're interested in her early on. Um, which doesn't mean they shouldn't read it later as well. It's one of her, I think, best books. Um, but the reason is that all most of the essays in it were originally published um, in uh, either the New Yorker or the New York Review of Books or other similar journals. And so they really are meant um, for a, a non-academic audience. That's one reason. That doesn't mean they're easy. I mean, I think one thing that I always encounter reading this book is respect for people who read the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books 30 and 50 years ago. Uh, there was no way these kind of essays would ever be published in those journals today. Um, they're just too demanding. And I, that is itself uh, um, a, a commentary on, on our intellectual culture uh, today. But um, the, the last and I think most important reason that I, I, I try and suggest this book and the essays in this book to people is because um, they are all designed uh, around particular uh, political issues. And, and so they, they, they really do reflect, in my mind, what is most amazing about Hannah Arendt, uh, which is that she is uh, a profound, philosophically trained thinker who writes about the real world and about politics. And these are all questions that are, for her, burning questions about the modern world. Um, they are what she calls exercises in political thinking. Um, and that means that they are an attempt to think uh, about politics. And as she says in the prologue uh, here to this book, um, they really are uh, an attempt to um, think without banisters, to think in this gap, as she calls it, between past and future, to get used to the challenge and difficulty and need to think absent the old guardrails, the traditions, the values that for um, a long period of time really did, um, as she says, make thinking unnecessary for most of the people. Uh, I mean, this is the argument you know, that she has here is that most people throughout most of the time in history don't think, they don't have to. Um, the general values and traditions that they grow up in give them a sense of, of how to live their lives. And it's only a very rare few of artists and intellectuals who challenge that and, and create the changes in history. What she says is that with the break of tradition in the modern age, and, and, and World War II is, is simply for her the final snapping point, um, we are in a position where everybody has to think. And uh, this is new, and most of us are not uh, used to it and not habituated to it. And so she sees the essays in this book as exercises in teaching us once again how to think. And uh, I find them to be some of the best uh, examples of her thinking and writing uh, that we have. Um, we started reading the book before uh, the election and before we then turned to the origins of totalitarianism. So for those of you who weren't with us then, I have um, introductions and the uh, taped conversations of the first uh, of the prologue and the first two chapters uh, are available uh, online and Dan sent out the links to those so you can uh, you can get to them. The essay that we're uh, talking about today um, is in my mind the first of a substantive you know, essay, I mean, the others are historical, the concept of history and on the break of tradition, tradition in the modern age. And now we enter 
a, a series of essays, or well, two, two in particular, what is authority and what is freedom, that um, are, are attempts to talk about the two most important political uh, ideas um, for Hannah Arendt. Um, any successful politics for Arendt needs both freedom and authority. And, uh, and so these two essays are an attempt for her to articulate what are these two things, freedom and authority. Freedom here is another way of speaking about power, since um, freedom is to act uh, in concert with others, or power is to act in concert with others and to create something new, which is an act of political freedom. Um, so what is authority? Uh, in its simplest answer, her answer is, we can't answer that question because it no longer exists. We have to ask what was authority. Authority has ceased to exist in the modern world. Um, so what is what was authority? Authority is um, a way of, a, a kind of rule, a kind of um, uh, obedience that is non-violent, non-coercive, and voluntary. So when you um, live in an authoritarian government, you actually live freely. Um, and this is, of course, somewhat counterintuitive to, to many of us, but it's, it's also related to the Kantian idea that freedom uh, is autonomy, autonomos, or self-rule. So that when you live freely, you actually live according to um, a law, a nomos, that you impose upon yourself. And so authority is a, a, no, a law uh, that is imposed on you, but that you accept fully and consensually and impose on yourself. And so the essay is about, um, it happens in a series of parts, but it's about the mistaken ideas of authority that we have. And she mentions two primary traditions of that. They're both from Greece. The Platonic mistaken idea of authority, which is that says that authority um, is what is rational or true or the rule of experts. And the Aristotelian uh, mistaken idea of authority, which says that authority is educational. And both of these, uh, she says, end up sneaking the violence back into the definition of authority. In Plato, the violence of the few, the experts who will impose their uh, truth on the many, and in Aristotle, the violence of the educator who takes it upon themselves to educate um, others, which in politics is the same as brainwashing for RN. And the only real tradition of authority that she recognizes uh, or not the only, but the, the the sort of quintessential and exemplary tradition of authority that she recognizes is Roman. Uh, and the key uh, to the Roman tradition of authority is that for the Romans, they had the experience of foundation, namely the experience of the founding of Rome, the the battle uh, with Romulus and, 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 the, and the old Romans, and the decision to create together a new country, and that this experience of the free founding of Rome um, is carried through in Roman politics uh, through um, this idea of the Senate. Uh, for her, the Senate is the um, tie back to the Roman experience of foundation, and, and, and the inverted pyramid is such that the, the true authority in Rome is buried deep in the past and um, all Roman current politics or you know, in Roman times um, seeks to clothe itself in the authority of the past and in doing so re-inscribes itself in the authority of the Roman past, which is accepted as binding. And this, um, for her is what a true authoritarian uh, regime is, one that accepts and holds on to this original experience, which it constantly tries to re-enliven with the present. And the only modern 
successful attempt to recreate the Roman model that she understands to exist is the United States of America. Um, and she says that the founders, which are appropriately called the founding fathers, um, studied Rome and explicitly tried to copy this Roman idea. And they were also lucky in that they um, had a revolution in which they sought to uh, recreate um, power and authority. And the revolution happened in a place that was not a nation state and that had um, local governments and charters, states and towns in which people had the experience of governing themselves. And so that the revolution was a refounding of American freedom. And what the, but the brilliance in her mind of the American founders was to transfer the seat of authority from the legislature, the Senate, to the courts, to the judiciary, and specifically to the Supreme Court and the Constitution, such that the Supreme Court, for her, like the Senate in Rome, becomes a, a constitutional convention that never ends, and that the Supreme Court is an attempt to constantly um, reconnect the present with the founding generation of the past, and thus preserve the experience of founding into the present. And uh, she develops this at length, not in this essay, but in her book on revolution, um, where she uh, talks about these, 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 these issues uh, quite quite a bit. Um, in many ways, the What is Authority essay is an early version of Chapter 5 of On Revolution on Authority, and the What is Freedom essay is an early version of Chapter 4 on On Revolution on the American Experience of Power. Um, so anyway, the overarching thrust of, of this essay, if I can be so bold as to say it, because it's a confusing essay, is that um, we live in a time in which, uh, uh, for the most part, politics is seen as corrupt. Uh, just like Machiavelli saw both the state of Rome and the religion of Rome as corrupt, we today, if we're honest, understand the corruption of Western liberal democracies. And that the only way to establish authority again, to reestablish authority in the modern age, is through a refoundation, a revolution. And she understands revolution as this sense of a refounding of our fundamental freedoms, of our fundamental values. Um, and so this is a, an essay calling for or at least suggesting that in order to refound our our politics we would need to um have something like a revolution but she doesn't think necessarily a revolution has to be violent i mean she, she makes this point here against machiavelli and against robespierre she thinks the american revolution different from the american liberation from england was largely nonviolent, and that it can happen as long as it um, appeals to uh, institutions in that are living that reflect uh, an old uh, original sense of freedom and uh, and power and authority. And so she's here in a sense. I guess I'm not going to say calling for a revolution, but saying that if we are going to refound authority and freedom, we need something like a revolutionary refounding. And this is very much um, what uh, the book is about. So um, maybe I, I stop there and uh, and see if you guys have some questions or thoughts comments. I understand it's a hard essay. Um, there's no doubt about that. So if you have particular questions about passages, we can go into those. Or if you want to try and head straight up into the clouds of what she means by a revolution, um, we can do that as well. 
Happy to take questions in the chat function or you can turn on your mic and ask a question. If you want me to politicize it, right? I mean, one way to see the last election was that both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump portrayed themselves as somewhat of revolutionary candidates, explicitly so, especially Sanders, um, which shows that there's a lot of people in this country who um, are open to the idea of a revolution. It does, again, it doesn't have to be a violent revolution, but there's a feeling of a need for a cleansing, um, of a refounding. Um, what that would mean, I don't think any of us know. And one of the things that Arendt is, is, is clear about in her writings in the 1960s on the student revolution or the student movements is that the student movements um, were existing at a time in which power and authority had largely disappeared and were lying in the street. And the fact that the student movements didn't lead to a revolution for Arendt was an indication of something she thought was true, which is that the student movements did not have any strong sense of where the revolution should lead. And one of her critiques of modern revolutionaries is that they are rehashing old slogans, communism, socialism, welfare statism, uh, populism, whatever it is, and that those slogans have proven not to work, uh, have in, not to work, not only not to work tactically, but not to work in the sense that they don't actually um, uh, have a chance or don't actually represent the viewpoint of uh, someone anywhere close to a majority of the people. And so what she says is, um, in order to bring about a revolution, you have to actually um, do the work of politics, which is to learn to speak to the people, uh, to learn to speak in a way that the people uh, will um, uh, respond to what you're saying. And so much of what we see today by those would-be revolutionaries are people who think they know the truth, right? They know the slogans, they know their doctrine, and they want to um, impose it. And so a big part of, of Arendt's uh, thinking is to uh, ask us to do the work of actually trying to rethink what would it mean to have solidarity and uh, and have a, a popular, consensually uh, developed new idea of political freedom and political authority uh, in the present moment. And that's the work she thinks has not been done and needs to be done. So I see, I don't know if I, I have no, uh, are you, are, are people following this at all? Does this make some sense? Just give me a little sense of what's confusing and what's not. Uh, this is Pat Moriarty, Roger. Hi, Pat. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just two items, so they're trivial really, but in her discussion, her definitions that she gives, which are, you know, kind of a little vague, I would say, uh, I kept thinking of, of the word convention. She's talking about convention. I mean, Romans lived a life making assumptions uh, in the family and, and in, in their government that rule their lives. And if I bring it to today and President Trump's uh, aversion of all convention dealing with the presidency and uh, individual respect to people and so on, he's establishing a totally unconventional uh, uh, environment for uh, political uh, uh, discussion or interaction. The second uh, thing I thought about when reading it is why she excludes persuasion from uh, uh, authority. I mean, I, I, persuasion uh, uh, implies reason to me, and it would be odd for me to 
put reason out of the picture when I'm talking about, uh, uh, when I'm thinking about authority. That's it. Um, uh, excellent, Pat. So um, on the question of persuasion, I'll start there. Um, persuasion is, a, is an important part of her understanding of politics. Politics for her is always about persuasion. Um, but persuasion, um, uh, if you have to persuade somebody, right, um, you are not an authority. An authority is um, someone or some idea that people simply accept um, without the need for persuasion. Um, and so persuasion uh, is part of politics and it's part of uh, what she would call power. Um, in order to have power, you need to persuade people uh, of your views. But authority um, is not a persuasive idea for her. Um, so to take an example, why do we um, obey the Constitution or, or, or think that the Constitution should tell us whether or not abortion should be legal? Right. This isn't a, a persuasive ar ar argument for her. You don't have to persuade people about abortion in the Constitution. The idea is that the Constitution has become a kind of unquestioned authority, or it did become that, whether it still is or not is an interesting question. And she says that the moment the Constitution became worshipped in the United States of America was the moment that authority was created in the United States of America. So um, there's a, there's a, for her, um, if you have to persuade someone, it means that the authority doesn't exist. Um, that doesn't mean, now, she doesn't think that all politics should be about authority, not at all. She just thinks that authority is one important part of a lasting political world. Um, if you have a political world without authority, it can be very free and it can be very vibrant and it can, in fact, it's probably more free uh, than a world that has authority in it, but it won't last. It will at some point um, uh, disappear for our end. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is why uh, she excludes persuasion. In a sense, persuasion has a kind of violence to it. Uh, not physical violence necessarily, although you can use physical violence to persuade, but a kind of attempt to impose your will on others. Um, so, so that's why. Um, on your first question about convention, I, I don't know if she uses the word convention. She, she, she talks about authority um, as comprised of what she calls the Roman Trinity of religion, tradition, and authority. And, um, you know, do these things overlap? Yes. Uh, are they different? Probably in some ways. But what she means by them uh, is that a tradition is what's carried over. Traditio just means to carry through or carry over. Um, and there are certain ways of being that are carried over. We call them customs or habits. But it's not just habit in a sense of it's done, but habit in the sense of it's done and it's right. And in order for that second part to emerge, you have to actually believe that the founders, the, his, the, 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 the precursors, the founding fathers, the the ancestors have some value to them. And that comes with this idea of a tradition that is living and meaningful, such that the argument that this is the way it's been done doesn't seem like an argument of imposition, but seems like an argument that we understand and makes sense. So today, since the Enlightenment, one would argue or could argue, to say, why should I 
wear my hat, not wear my hat inside, or why should I open the door for somebody, or why should I um, uh, listen when someone talks to me? And you say, that's the way it's been done. And they say, well, I don't know if I respect that anymore. And so without a living tradition, um, she doesn't think you can have authority. Religion uh, you know, has different elements to it. It has the element of um, uh, violence in the sense of the belief in hell, which she talks a lot about in this essay. Um, but she thinks that's not central to religion. That's sort of added later as a political um, uh, uh, addition. The basic idea of religion, religion is religio, a, a retying, a relegation. And it's an attempt to um, tie us back again to some uh, truth, in this case, the, the word of God. Um, so you have, you need, in a sense, all three, tradition, religion, and then the combination of them being authority. You know, she talks at the end of section three, I, I believe. Um, uh, she, she, she gives three examples of the sort of loss of, of, of such, of this Trinity. And maybe it's the end of section four and yeah, end of section four on page 128. And she says, Luther's error was to think that you could challenge temporal authority, right? The, the authority of the princes and um, the temporal authority of the church, the the the, uh, the actual popes, and appeal to some sort of uh, true religion, and somehow leave tradition and religion intact. And what she says is no, by by attacking the temporal authority of the church, he actually um, began the destruction of religion and uh, tradition. Uh, because tradition means the value of the past. And she says it was Hobbes's error and others of the 17th century to hope that authority and religion could be saved. But if you give up tradition, because Hobbes said, we don't want to, we don't want to be bound by Aristotle and by the Greeks. We want to be bound by reason, but we want reason to support religion and authority. And she says, that's not going to work either. And then she says, um, the humanists uh, said that we would hope that we could um, keep authority and religion, but do away with tradition. Um, I mean, to remain with an unbroken tradition of the West, but without religion and authority, because we no longer believe in religion and we no longer believe in sort of these authorities. And that doesn't work either. And so um, it's this combination, Pat, of, of religion, authority, and tradition. Um, which is much more than just habit or convention um, that she's uh, suggesting is at the root of an authoritarian system. I don't know if, you know, I mean, what, is, what does it mean to really have this trinity, right, of religion, tradition, and um, authority? I mean, it's a good question. But for RN, I mean, if you want to put it in contemporary context, she thinks that there's a period in the United States history when the Supreme Court has this kind of authority. And it can, and, and it's seen as an embodiment of the founding generation of the Constitution. It's seen as a kind of religion. We are a constitutional country. And as a result, um, the decisions of the Supreme Court are seen as right and authoritative, um, and you don't have to persuade people of them, and uh, and you and you don't have to, and people feel free when they are under them. Um, clearly, uh, the politicization of the Supreme Court, thus the removal of its authority and of its religion. And the attempt to hold on to its tradition, but without the religion and authority, has taken a huge toll on the overall authority of the Supreme Court. And she, she makes that case uh, in her book on revolution as well.
Um, so that's uh, my attempt to, 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 to dig deeper into what she means by authority and distinguish it, from, Pat, from convention. I hope that is clear. I'm happy to come back to that. Beautiful. Oh, it's terrifically clarifying. I just want to make some side remark. As a, a child or a good part of some part of my life as a Roman Catholic, <laughs> I enjoyed thoroughly her discussion of religion and so on. Not that I agreed with much of it, but I, I certainly loved her talk about hell and the fear. And I remember all those retreats in childhood about all the sins that were going to send me to hell since I was guilty of almost all of them. Anyway, thank you, Roger, as usual. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I you know, I don't think she she wants to bring back hell, but she is as someone who lived through the hell of the 20th century, she is uniquely aware of the political meaning of the loss of hell. And she thinks the loss of hell is one of the things that makes possible something like Nazism and Stalinism. Um so Jack asks about Sanders revolution as an appeal to the logic underlying socialist theory regarding the source of wealth. Trump's revolution is an appeal to make America great again. This is not a call to the founding structural principles, but to the social norms of rejected past. Yeah, I, I think both are, I think I would say that about both, which is why I don't think both, I don't think either the Sanders or the Trump revolutions, if you want to call them that, um, have a great chance of succeeding uh, in the United States without a lot of violence. Um, I don't believe that either of them speak to the uh, the founding uh, principles and ideals of the United States. And thus, um, I don't think they can get a, a wide majority, either of them. Um, I mean, that's that's my view. Uh, politics would mean trying to develop understandings across political lines these days and finding some common truths that um, people, despite their differences, could get behind. Um, Arendt, in, her, in, in an essay I think we've read in this, uh, in this group a long time ago, on thoughts on politics and revolution, um, uh, talks about the that what's really missing from revolutionaries today um, is an analysis, an honest analysis of the present situation, um, and that means I think there's you know you see that in an interview and you say what does it mean? It sounds good, but to to unpack what an honest analysis of the present situation is is in my mind the political challenge for many of us today. It means to honestly confront our own limited perspectives, to honestly listen to those we really disagree with and find um, offensive or, or disagreeable, and tr make an effort to find, to analyze the present situation, to, to understand it, and then attempt from that to develop a, a political vision that could uh, unite people across their pluralities and differences. Um, that's what politics is for our end. And I think a revolutionary politics is one that would do that with the idea being that we are currently living in a time of such corruption that we need to um, we need to radically return to core principles and core values. Um, that's what I take her to understand a revolution to be. And what that means is not everyone's going to get what they want. Uh, and we're going to have to give up our certainties and return to a, a much more, in an American sense, a much more uh, humble idea of a federated republic rather than um, a, a large bureaucratic uh, state that imposes a particular vision of the world on a, a lot of people. Um, that's her vision, uh, not saying everyone w will or should agree with it, uh, but that's how she would understand the possibility of a revolution emerging. 
Natalia writes, Roger, what do you think is the central difference between the authority in Plato's and Aristotle's sense and this authority RN seems to believe that can be refound through revolution? Okay, I mean, the, the difference would be that for Plato, right, uh, the authority comes from a few philosophers, a few thinkers who can see the truth, the philosopher who comes out of the cave. And his models, remember the models, I mean, she, she's, very, she's very astute in her reading of Plato. She says, look at all the models he uses, right? The captain of the ship, the healer, the, the, the physician, um, the, the horse trainer. What they all share is that they're experts. They've got expertise. And they are going to teach or give their expertise and tell others how to be a better healer or how to heal their body or how to train their horses or how to steer a ship. And so she says, this is, these are all examples that don't come from politics where people are equal. They come from the private sphere where there's mastery and slavery. And so for Plato, there's always a sense that the, um, the refounding um, of authority is going to be based on the knowledge of the wise, which will be um, imposed upon the many. But when the many don't want it imposed on them, um, Plato's answer is tell them myths, tell them stories, deceive them. And so it's an elitist uh, view that the elite um, has a vision that they've discovered and they will use propaganda and deception and stories to bring the masses along. That's how she understands the platonic idea of authority. It's not really authority because it's violent and therefore uh, not, and not freely adopted and that she, therefore she doesn't call it authority. For Aristotle, it's similar, uh, but instead of one philosopher uh, who knows, um, the idea is that we're supposed to create an educational environment where people are educated into uh, a knowledge of, um, of how to live well. Um, but again, she says this, this idea of authority through education always smacks of a kind of elitism and a kind of um, brainwashing, where we would brainwash uh, those who disagree with us. And that politics for her is not about um, brainwashing, not about educating the unwashed masses, but it's about talking and engaging and and the model here, I mean, just to go down to basics so that we all know what she actually has in mind, the model here is um, town councils in New England and workers' councils in Hungary and Russia, Russia in the 1917, the Soviets, and Hungary during the 1956 revolution, um, and the debating societies in Paris during the French Revolution. These are her models of places in which Experts didn't come in to govern, but there was a sense that just the regular people would get together, talk, argue, debate, and come up with uh, the ideas of how to um, uh, govern themselves. And it's this experience. Remember, I, I didn't say foundation itself before when we're talking about Roman authority. It's the experience of foundation. And it was this experience of people engaged in and participating in the politics of founding, the politics of revolution, that for Arendt um, uh, is the source of authority. Uh, and you have to keep that experience in some way alive, which means that it can't be from the top down. It can't be from elites or from philosophers or from teachers. Um, and so, uh, Natalia, you ask what the difference is. The difference is that for RN, she, she thinks that um, there can't be a privileging of the educated or the wise here. And this is something that goes through all of RN's writing, right? She, she doesn't think 
education makes you wiser. She doesn't think education makes you a better political, a better judge or a better judge of political, um, uh, of political, uh, what, what should be done politically. Um, you know, this comes from her experience, honestly, I think in Germany during World War II and the lead up to it, where many of the most educated Germans, including Martin Heidegger, uh, in her view, made horrific political judgments. Um, and in her view as well, many of the people who acted best during um, the Nazi period were uneducated peasants who saved, um, saved Jews or hid Jews or acted in the resistance. And so she came very clearly to believe that education does not yield good political judgment. In fact, she even goes the opposite direction at one point and says, because education, at least the way we currently think of education, academic education, teaches you how to rationalize and how to abstract, it actually teaches you how to um, rationalize all things, including evil. And that there's a way in which the educated segments of society are even more politically suspect than the uneducated for her. Um, and so uh, that's a long answer to Natalia's question, but I think it's an important one. Um, I, I think that the, the, the answer to your question is that for our end, this is not going to be an elite driven project, the revolution. Now, Let's also remember that the founding fathers in America and the United States, many of them were elites, but some of them weren't. Um, and, but what they all were, in her mind, were people who were engaged actively in politics on a local level and thus actively engaged with non-elites on a regular basis. And that for her was, was, was very important. Ron asks, um, would you speak about her views on the self-evident truths? Our Declaration of Independence, which preceded the Constitution and catalyzed the revolution, strongly asserts such. Our American political authority seems to owe a great deal to these self-evident truths. So um, one way she speaks about self-evident truths is um, that the self-evident truths are those things known by the elites which then have to be imposed upon the people. So she talks about for Plato, right, the, the truths that the philosopher gets when he comes out of the cave are self-evident, but they're not self-evident for the masses. And they have to either be persuaded, killed, or, or, or deceived. Um, what she says when she talks about the self-evident truths uh, in this book is that the American founders and the French revolutionaries both understood it in important ways that in order to get the people on board, um, they would in some important way need uh, a kind of violent authority. Um, and that's why she says that people like John Adams and others in the American founding generation wanted to hold on to the idea of hell and understood that hell was politically useful. Uh, and the self-evident truths are another form of this, another way of, in a sense, creating a kind of, of myth um, that is a kind of violent uh, imposition. Um, they themselves are not uh, authorities. They are crutches for uh, a loss of or a lack of or an insufficient authority. And at one point she says um, that these authorities of the use of hell and the use of uh, uh, truths um, on the one hand are helpful, right? But on the other hand, they actually are dangerous because they, in the end, um, weaken 
uh, uh, authority. So she says this on um, 132. Um, platonically speaking, she writes to the top of the page, platonically speaking, the few cannot persuade the multitude of truth because truth cannot be the object of persuasion. And persuasion is the only way to deal with the multitude. So just to make sure that makes sense to people, um, truth is not something that you can persuade people of. Truth is something that is true and therefore has to be seen with the eye in the platonic sense. Politics, opinions are things we persuade people of, not truths. And so platonically speaking, the few cannot persuade persuade the multitude of truth because truth cannot be the object of persuasion and persuasion is the only way to deal with the multitude. But the multitude carried away by the irresponsible tales of poets and storytellers can be persuaded to believe almost anything. The appropriate tales which carry the truth of the few to the multitude are tales about rewards and punishments after death, persuading the citizens of the existence of hell will make them beh behave as though they knew the truth. So that's the hope. Um, but she then says in the next paragraph, I mean, in the bottom of the page, the last paragraph on that page, the introduction of the platonic hell into the body of Christian dogmatic beliefs strengthened religious authority to the point where it could hope to remain victorious in any contest with secular power. But the price paid for this additional strength was that the Roman concept of authority was diluted and an element of violence was permitted to insinuate itself into both the very structure of Western religious thought and the hierarchy of the church. I think you could say the same thing about um, the language of hell and punishments in the founding generation, but also in the language of um, uh, uh, self-evident truths. It's a kind of myth that strengthens um, political or religious authority, but in the end weakens it, um, dilutes it, because it provides it, – it, it, what it does is by convincing people through these stories or these myths, it actually allows them to exit politics and over time allows politics to be corrupted. Uh, by the elite and by the lack of participation of the people. And so that is um, what I take her to mean by the uh, use of self-evident truths, Ron. Okay. Uh, Roger. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I think what you're saying has a lot of uh, plausibility uh, with regard to the nature of politics. But she also speaks about the American Revolution as a moment of founding. And this declaration has served uh, for two centuries and more uh, as a focal point for political persuasion, discussion, debate. And it seems to me that it's functioned in a way very comparable to the presuppositions of a polity that practiced the kind of politics she's advocating. Um, so uh, I don't think it would have the kind of staying power it has uh, if it were um, uh, a, a diversion from uh, the actual uh, practice of the highest form of politics that of which we're capable. It, it seems to be a a um, outcome, an expression of the recognized presuppositions of having a polity. Mm -hmm. And that's what was in a way discovered at the time of this unique revolution coming, as you say, quite um, persuasively out of uh, many experiences of self-government where equality and uh, a certain fundamental right to have rights, which she yeah. advocated, right? Uh, I'm sorry, that just seems to be the another direction of thinking here. Well, so, so Ron, I, I guess 
what I I'm, I'm not sure. I I don't disagree with what you've said about the American Revolution, but I don't see how that relates to what I said about um, self-evident truths. Arendt, um, Arendt believes that the American Revolution was itself a successful um, founding. Now, when she just just to be clear that for her, the American Revolution begins somewhere around 1775 and doesn't end until um, really about 1810 um, or so, more or less. The point I'm making with that is she, she makes a distinction between the American liberation from England and the American Revolution. And the liberation frees you from a tyrant, but only with the successful fulfillment of a revolution do you found freedom. And the freedom really only becomes founded in America in a meaningful way for her once, A, once the Constitution uh, is established, but once it becomes, in a sense, secure and almost worshipped. Um, the, the language of, of, of truths, self-evident truths, right, um, which are which is certainly important language and is part of our tradition and not to be denied. She thinks of as somewhat, uh, well, as a, as a crutch that the founders used because they weren't confident that they could do without it. Um, uh, that doesn't mean she was against it, right? But what she's saying is that to the extent that the self-evident truths are what takes over in our constitutional tradition, we actually risk weakening our constitutional tradition because it um, leads to a, 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 a retreat of people from the essence of that tradition, which is um, the experience of foundation. So, um, yes, she thinks that the tradition has been successful, the, the revolution was successful, that freedom was founded, and that it has been enormously lasting and, 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 and uh, it has persevered. But we should also remember that the last chapter of her book on revolution is called The Lost Treasure of the American Revolution. And she fears that writing as she is in 19, early 1960s, that the American revolutionary treasure has largely been lost. And um, how we resurrect it, I think, is the problem she is leaving us with. But in any case, the point is for, that, I, that I'm trying to make here is that for her, the, 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 the appeal to things like self-evident truths are an understandable, meaningful, and yet in the end, counterproductive attempt to buttress uh, insecure authority. Well, this is a fascinating discussion. It really is. Um, if I understand Lincoln's, he brought the declaration in judgment of the interpretation of the Constitution. And that was for him the founding, um, which of course had powerful expression in the Constitution, but the mm -hmm. uh, uh, but ethically, uh, in terms of the, the the most fundamental commitments, and here I would see also a in the background, a, a which Orn Revolution certainly uh, brings to the fore, um, or her book, uh, a covenantal understanding of that founding, mutual promises that were made uh, yeah. by citizens at that time, 
And I agree with all the problems that self-evident truths imposed on the public could, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the problems you're citing and which she cites. But it just seems to me there may be another way in which they surfaced at that time and served as a kind of um, compass for uh, really, you know, at the end of uh, Eichmann, the book on Eichmann's, how the, out of, it's like there's a self-evident really truth. Like in it. a little better these last two days. Yeah, so, yeah I mean, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to say that the self-evident truths that the declaration appeals to are unimportant, right, at all. I mean, I think that they are, not only are they important, they're part of the American constitutional tradition, as you rightly said. Uh, all I'm suggesting is that what she's saying is that the authority that this tradition has, those truths were appealed to, just like Adam said we had to appeal to a religion with punishments in state constitutions, um, because of a fear that the authority on secular rationalist grounds wouldn't be enough. And that um, they helped, right? She, she thinks they helped. Right? They, they <laughs> add, they, as, as she says, you know, I, in what I just read, you know, they, they, they add to it, they strengthen, right? These beliefs strengthen religious authority the belief in hell, just like I think the appeal to truth, strength, and political authority. But there's a price paid for this. Yes, I, I understand. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Jack, you're sharing your screen, I think, so you might want to just check that and unshare. No, your I screen. don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think I just turned my mic on. Oh. Uh, well, you're blue, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm blue. I'm, I, 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 I turned my mic on and you're seeing me. So, yeah. uh, because I, I cover my, I cover my, the, the eyes of the world, you know, mm -hmm. on my computer. But I, I wanted to add that the, um, the, the self-evident truths are the, are the uh, justification for the founding. In the Declaration, these truths are endowed by our Creator, right? And governments are created to secure those rights, that, the, that, that these truths include rights, include rights that are endowed by our creator and that the purpose of government is to secure these rights. That's what it says in the, in the, in the declaration. And it basically announces we are going to create a government whose purpose is to secure and protect these rights. So in a way, it, it justifies the, the subsequent effort to create some kind of confederation of the states. Uh, or to justify a, a, a self-government, a new kind of government following the victory over the um, over the uh, the British, to, oh, following the liberation from the British. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I mean, the only question really is is where do these rights come from? To the extent they're self-evident, RN says, then they are largely not self-evident to anyone except those who can see them. And for others, they have to be imposed or they're self-evident because people engaged in the act of governing and self-government come to recognize them themselves. Right. And that's the that's the that's the fault line that has been that we're, that we're sort of dancing around. I, th um, I think that's right. I think it, it's uh, the I uh, just wanted uh, just to c conclude the the, the uh, self-evident the the character of these truths to be self-evident means there's no arguing about them. They are they they are real whether we believe them or not. And I think the purpose of that it, it's in, in the Platonic sense. You're right. That is, there the philosopher understands them. Anybody who sees that understands how self-evident they are. And then their hope is that everybody will see that they are self-evident. But that the the point of calling them self-evident is really to to uh, uh, avoid having the conversation. Well, where do they, what are these rights and where do they come from? It's basically okay. we have these rights. They're given they're endowed by the Creator. End of discussion. This isn't the self evident uh, yeah. sort of an appeal to natural law, and really isn't that a way around? 
determining right and wrong or truthfulness via religious tests. That was, that's, so that was my idea. That the natural law, and it's arguable what it means, natural law, what the, you know, when you implement things, you're going to have to work on them. But it's to avoid a religious test, even though there's a reference to the creator. But in the implementation of the, of the laws, of the nation's laws, we, we don't get, we shouldn't be involved in a religious test. We can, we can appeal to natural law. That's my Although natural law is appealed to by God in the, in the, in the document. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's seen but not as an a, but not an implementation. No, no, I mean, I think it's an appeal to, uh, something that is non political and aren't as if anything, you should all be learning by now, right? Is RN is always suspicious of the non-political, um, uh, because it comes from somewhere, and so she's always worried about it. Um, Jack has a question, which I'm going to just very briefly about the difference between a dictator and uh, and an authority or a tyrant. You know, I mean, these are words that matter, and an RN cares a lot about them. So she's going to distinguish a tyrant from uh, a dictator, from uh, an authoritarian regime. Um, and in her mind, an authoritarian regime is not a really bad thing in sense so far as authority is where obedience is free and not violently opposed. Um, in fact, for her, there's a lot more freedom in authoritarian regime than there is in a non-authoritarian democracy. Um, uh, so uh, that's an important distinction to, to, to hold on to. Authoritarianism is not a bad thing for her, but she's using it in a very particular way that we have to be aware of. Um, Harold has a question about how Arendt sees originalism. <laughs> uh, you know, Arendt is, you know, so the answer to that, Harold, is that for her, um, the Supreme Court, as I said before, is supposed to be like a reincarnation of a constitutional convention. But that means that they're supposed to be a reincarnation today of the people in the constitutional convention. Um, and so uh, I think it's a very powerful idea of constitutional interpretation that more people in law schools and writing about law should actually take note of. But in short, what she's saying is uh, um, you should interpret the Constitution in the spirit of uh, the um, of the founding experience, uh, but not controlled by the time period of it. And so um, it's an idea that you should find the principles of the Constitution and in those principles. Um, interpret it such that uh, it is living today. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think it fits directly with the living spirit, living constitutional model or the originalist model. But um, uh, it's, if, if you know Ronald Dworkin's work on, on principled interpretation, it would be closest to that um, in that sense. Um, Gary Patton asks, this article from today's Times significantly notes that what Trump did in firing Comey violated no rule or law, but did violate a tradition within the federal government and that this is what makes it dangerous. In other words, it makes exactly the point that you just made in discussing Arendt's view of tradition. Um, yeah, I mean, so certainly someone like, I mean, we, we live in an age in which tradition seems to have value only when you like the tradition. And this is true for all sides. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Trump has no use for tradition. He's about as anti-tradition as you come. Um, uh, and but he's not the only one. Um, so I, I, I take that to be the case. I mean, I think there's another. Um, you say this is what makes it dangerous. I mean, I think the, the other part of what makes this dangerous is simply that, um, once again, uh, facts are being completely 
uh, manipulated and reformed on an hourly basis in, in this discussion, and that, and, and that makes it quite dangerous as well. But uh, but uh, but yes, I mean, but yes, I mean, the attack, the attack tradition, tradition that Trump uh, has uh, has. Uh, Roger, your audio is fading. I'm sorry. I, is your it back? audio is fading. Yeah, your audio is, it, is fading. Is it back now or not? Yes, it's back now. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the attack on tradition is dangerous. And if you think of what I said before about uh, the need for a revolution within a corrupt period of government, um, one needs to have some hope that the revolution will uh, lead to a, a, a return to a non-corrupt era. Uh, and the tradition and the founding experience can serve as one exemplar of that. Uh, clearly, Trump has not in any way succeeded in, in making that case, at least to the vast majority of Americans. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, his, I think to see him as a, a revolutionary, uh, in any kind of meaningful sense would be uh, a mistake precisely because of what Gary's pointing out. Uh, Suzanne writes on 135, RN makes the statement about modern ideologies at the top of 135. And they're being better than any religion at immunizing our souls against the impact of reality. This struck me as very strong. Can you say more about this? Um, so, yeah, let's just take a look at it. This is within a large uh, um, parenthetical. It's within a parenthesis. And she's talking about um, – she's saying that it is not surprising that all these attempts at retaining the only element of violence – um, from crumbling edifice of religion and using it as a safeguard for the new should be in vain. And it was by no means the rise of socialism or the Marxian belief that religion is the opiate of the people, which put an end to them. Um, and then in the parentheses, authentic religion in general and the Christian faith in particular, with its unrelenting stress on the individual and his role in salvation, which led to the elaboration of a catalog of sins, could never be used as tranquilizers. Modern ideologies, whether political or psychological or social, are far better fitted to immunize man's soul against the shocking impact of reality than any traditional religion we know. Compared with various superstitions of the 20th century, the pious resignation to God's will seems like a child's pocket knife in competition with atomic weapons. God, it's a great line, huh? So um, what she's saying here is – that if you think back to our discussion of ideologies in the origin of totalitarianism, in which he says that the core of um, uh, totalitarianism or one of the core elements of totalitarianism is the hatred of reality uh, and the um, distaste for reality because reality is messy and difficult to come up with and difficult to – uh, and, and makes and, and especially in an age in which we are existentially lonely and isolated and homeless and rootless, reality is really uncomfortable. And so what she says in the origins, right, is that ideologies, coherent fictions, and an ideology is a, a logos, a truth about an idea, and it says that one idea can explain everything. It's a coherent fiction that explains everything. And in explaining it all um, gives it a kind of uh, uh, – gives the world a, a coherence and a stability that is attractive and satisfies our needs for understanding and making sense of the world. And especially if we uh, identify ourselves with this ideology, then gives our sense – ourselves a sense of purpose in being part of the people bringing the victory of this ideology to the world. Um, so this is an enormous um, rejection of reality, whereas Christianity, she's saying here, um, 
might reject reality, but it does so by saying reality sucks. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer, but eventually I'll go to heaven. <laughs> right. Uh, and she says, yeah, it's a rejection of reality in some sense, but much less so than an ideology, because in Christianity, you still have to live in the real world and suffer in it. And you only get saved from it after you die. Whereas in an ideology, we want to remake the world now. Uh, and if the world doesn't fit our, 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 our hopes and needs, we um, simply reject it. Um, Howard says, how can there be any authority in the Constitution of the Supreme Court when we have at least bifurcated in both our acceptance of the meaning of the Constitution and even the decisions of the Supreme Court and do not even accept a common set of facts? Well, the answer to that is you're right, but um, that's not how it always uh, – yeah, I mean, to the extent we now live in a world in which we don't share facts and we don't even, I mean, we should, we should, you know, we still believe there is a Supreme Court. That's a fact. And we, most of us agree on the nine people on it. That's a fact. Um, uh, so there are facts that we can still hold on to, increasingly few and increasingly less relevant ones. Um but uh, I think right now, one of the great, I mean, to go back to Ron Engel's point, if he's still on, right? I mean, you know, it is true that this country has been incredibly stable for 240 or so years, right? 50 years or whatever it is. And um, one of the reasons for that is that we've had this constitutional Supreme Court failsafe that people have accepted as a failsafe. Um, one of the great dangers, I think, of our moment is the complete politicization of the Supreme Court. I mean, wherever it started and however you want to understand it, when, you, when the Supreme Court is deciding a case right now and you listen to the commentators, nobody actually assumes that this is about the Constitution anymore. They assume it's about voting and, you know, the ideologies of these judges. And uh, in each case, it's talked about, well, vote counting. Do they have five votes? Do they have four votes? You know, is, 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 is this guy the swing vote? Is he going to change his vote? Are they going to barter for this or that? This may have always happened, right? And to some extent, it always did. But the way it's now seen is such that uh, – um, the authority of the court is radically diminished, and uh, there could easily become a time in which people simply don't accept it. I mean, I think the I, – I, I guess what I say is on an optimistic level, right? I mean, given the rampant politicization of the Supreme Court, what's sort of amazing in the United States of America in 2000. 17, is that people still find the Supreme Court to have a kind of authority. I mean, Bush v. Gore in many countries would have led to a revolution or a war. It didn't here. And that's somewhat extraordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why it's important somehow to, I mean, if you believe in trying to preserve the current country, uh, somehow preserving the Supreme Court as, in, as above politics is absolutely essential. Um, on the other hand, if you believe that we need a revolution, maybe you want to further politicize the court so that you spur a revolution on. Melissa writes, I'm with Arendt on that. I'm not sure what that is. Only with a return to what time tried ethics ingrained in a religion, authority, and tradition, can we possibly even begin to convict the unethical? Because the listening to those we disagree with is an attempt to develop a political vision which has the capacity to unite people across the board, will flow on from respect for the sacrifices one makes in their faiths, 
orders and charitable acts. Removal of authority and attempt to hold on to religion and tradition is impossible. Is Arendt asking us to appeal to the better nature of leaders, a foundation base for the revolution, not through persuasion, but through being genuine and true? I mean, certainly we could use some better leaders. Uh, but I think she's also saying, Melissa, that we need um, some better citizens. Um, and for her, that doesn't mean just being more informed and voting well. It means getting out and getting involved in politics. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the best thing that could happen is that all these people who are writing on Facebook about all their anger in this could actually go and join town halls and town zoning boards and run for assembly and try and actually get themselves elected and then have the challenge, the hard challenge, the hard work of actually governing, which is not easy. Um, but uh, that's what we need is more people engaged in that difficult activity of governing. I think that's what she thinks. Don't you think that Arendt's reading of tradition broadly construed is really another way for her to build upon a basic rejection of at least one kind of moral relativism, irrespective of the questions of metaphysics? So yeah, I mean, Arendt is anti-metaphysical, right? She doesn't believe there are any, um, I mean, there may be some metaphysical truths, but they're not political metaphysical truths. Um, and so, Tradition and religion and authority are for her, um, combined in the idea of authority, are for her a way to provide stability and um, perseverance uh, um, amidst uh, a conviction that there are no um, political truths. That's exactly right. She's, she's engaged in a project of trying to find um, stability and stable truths outside of metaphysical truths. Um, Mitch writes, is Arendt's critique of the 60s, a reading of them as rejecting all or any tradition without qualifications or distinction as to what is good or bad in tradition? No, I think she thinks that was much earlier. I think her critique of the 60s is that they're recycling old cliches and old slogans uh, that actually she thinks have very little connection to reality. Um, and uh, that in order to engage in a revolution, she thinks that the 60s were, the 60 activists were right in seeing that the governments of the period were illegitimate and powerless, but they were wrong in that they didn't actually build a movement that was powerful. And so the result is that they became a powerless movement that was yelling and screaming against the powerless government and nothing changed. Kim says, are we saying essentially that when self-evident truths are not seen or understood, we need to create myths? Well, that's not what we're saying. That's what Plato says. And that's what um, uh, um, Arendt thinks, and that's what she thinks that people like John Adams, to a certain extent, said uh, when he said that you can't have a political, a politics without religion and without uh, statements of hell and rewards. And so she says that these, this is a, an old idea of authority, but one that she doesn't accept. Um, Melissa asks about no constitution should not be used to challenge the nation's values and individuals' rights should not oppose the creator. Yes, and Hercules for Dworkin, exactly. Uh, um, Gary says, I've never heard that idea before that the Supreme Court is an ongoing constitutional convention. As a lawyer and as someone who's teaching legal studies at the University of California, I plan to follow up on that concept. Yeah, it's in... It's in chapters uh, four and five of Origins, I mean, of uh, On Revolution, Gary, and you can find her, her talking about it there. Um, can you please expand on Roger 
this Rogers statement about modern ideologies and their being. I think I've done that. I hope. Uh, thank you guys. Um, oh, the last sentence. Yeah, I'll talk about the last sentence. For to live in a political realm with neither authority nor the concomitant awareness that the source of authority transcends power and those who are in power means to be confronted anew without the religious trust in a sacred beginning and without the protection of traditional and therefore self-evident standards of behavior by the elementary problems of human living together. This is, uh, I take it to be um, the optimistic uh, part, right? Which is that if we accept the truth, which is that we live in a world without authority, where authority no longer exists, the one example of resurrecting authority is revolution. But either and this so this sentence could either be read as um uh well we're not going to have a revolution or in order to get a revolution we need to re-establish certain basic truths we have to accept the fact that authority doesn't exist that there is no authority that transcends power and we thus are confronted anew with the possibility that we can begin again. With, she has to be confronted anew without the religious trust in a sacred beginning and without the protection of traditional and therefore evident self-evident standards of behavior, so the self-evident truths, by the elementary problems of living together. And it's when we're confronted anew by these elementary problems of living together that we go about and experience a revolution, that we try and live together. And in doing so, develop new institutions and new experiences that will be a new founding, a refounding. And that's what she's calling for. It's a very difficult thing. And one of the real things it doesn't come from the top and it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from political actors getting together and confronting the elementary problems of living together. Where are we going to find places for people to live together? And right now, only people, you know, are living together with people they want to live together with. And that's okay. But how are we going to all live together? Right? And that's what Arendt is here talking about. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, we'll send out the, uh, the talk on uh, what is freedom, which is sort of the companion essay to this uh, soon, because it's already done. I've already I, I've, I've, I've taped that before. And uh, look forward to meeting with you to talk about what is freedom at our next session. The, uh, Dan will send out a, a schedule if you don't have it. It's also on our website. Thank you all very much and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Bye-bye.